Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobia Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A, coming to you from the Holy Land. Rabbi Tobia, the man singer, welcome back. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you. Very thank glad. you. Very glad, glad to have doing you back. Well. Big uh, pleasure to have me on. Absolutely. <laughs> As usual. So, absolutely. So, um... Yeah, was, yeah, as I was saying earlier, it, it was cold in here. I had to wear my jacket today because I forgot to turn on the heater. Uh, it's been it's been in the between the sixties and nineties, like all th- well, I say around sixties and seventies in the fall area. Uh, winter time would never hit, and then uh, about on Wednesday this week, it was ninety degrees here in Texas. Ninety degrees. Ninety degrees. Ninety degrees in late November. Yeah, and we finally started getting some cool, like cooler weather. Like today is forty-seven. Uh, last night it was like thirty-eight. Last night it's 40, 42 right now. So crazy stuff, man. It really is. So yeah. okay. Uh, well, we will no. yeah. get this show on the road then, by golly, and we will make sure everybody's happy out there. It was eighty for Zahara Bar David yesterday. That's crazy. All right, we'll roll out on this bad boy. Yes, my name is Stephen Petty. I'm calling to ask if you're teaching when you have the temple rebuilt and you start sacrifice, how much danger that's going to be for the Jewish people, because that's going to go against everything the Christians think they believe in. I'm just curious. Thank you. Sure does. Man. All right, Rabbi, take it away. Yeah. Yeah, us Jews are not really used to danger, so this is be a whole new, <laughs> yeah, a whole new experience for us. How will the Jews deal with danger? You know, we used to be just like Luxembourg, no issues at all. Um, as it turns out, when the Mashiach comes, you're quite right. The temple will be built. Its unused blueprints are contained in the last eight chapters of the book of Ezekiel, but there'll be no danger, not to the Jews, not to anyone, because in the Messianic age, there will be no Christianity. In the Messianic age, all the nations of the world will worship the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the Christians are going to come to the Jews, and they're going to say, Surely we've inherited lies and vanity. We're in. There can be no truth. How can a man make them themselves gods when they are not? Echoing the words of Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. The key feature of the messianic age is the whole world will know. That means if you live in a time where there's more than one religion, the Messiah has not yet come. All the nations will grab the shirt of a Jew, Zechariah 8.23, and they'll say, Nelcho imochem ki shomanu elohim imochem. They will say, let us go with you. And you notice that they grab the hem of a Jew. They have to grab the hem of a Jew because we wouldn't know what to do with them. It's a whole new experience for us but they're going to not let go. They're going to say, take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. They're going to wonder aloud about the suffering of the Jews. They'll be shocked because what has not been told to them, they'll finally understand what they had never heard, they'll finally perceive. And they'll ask, who would have believed our report? Look to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed. So in the Messianic age, there'll only be one faith, the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah 11, verse 9. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. In those days, everyone will know the truth, and God be one, and he will be one. Zechariah, chapter 14. So the key feature of the Messianic age is there is no other religion. There will be no atheists. There'll be no Christianity, there'll be no Hinduism, there'll be no other religion. All the peoples of the earth will speak in a pure speech, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. You ask about the sacrificial system, it's returning in its full order, as I mentioned. But as it turns out, all the nations 
will be bringing sacrifices. You don't even have to memorize this verse. Just remember the last verse of the entire book of Zechariah. The very last verse tells us that the kings will be bringing offerings in the Beis Hamigdush, in the final messianic temple. In fact, the Messiah himself will bring an offering for himself and the nation for unintentional sins. Remember, in the messianic age, rebellion will come to an end. Intentional sin will cease. There will be no rebellion against Hashem. All the nations will be of one accord. However, we won't become robots in the messianic age, meaning when Mashiach comes, it's not like no one will have a brain. It's just it, everything will be obvious. We now live in a oilam hasheker, in a world of lies. We live in a time when people think what is sweet is bitter and what is bitter is sweet. What is dark is light and what is light is dark. But when Mashiach comes, it will be an oilam ha'emes, a world of truth. Everyone will understand the truth. But still, people will make mistakes. Just like, I use this as an example. I like to cook. And I'm sure you do too, right? But sometimes you're making something for yourself in the kitchen. In short, I'm sure there are times when you inadvertently burn yourself in the kitchen. You inadvertently touch a pot that's hot. Inadvertently, when you're cutting uh, some salad, you're not paying attention carefully, and you cut yourself. And what do you say after you cut yourself? What's the second thing you say? You say, I'm so stupid. <laughs> Why do people cut themselves in the kitchen when preparing food? Why do people burn themselves in the kitchen when cooking? Because they're not paying attention, right? If people would pay attention, they would never cut themselves. So it happens that in the Messianic age, even if the Mashiach comes, People will still make mistakes, they'll be sloppy, they'll be careless, and as such, there is a offering, Leviticus chapter 4, that's assigned, Davka specifically, for unintentional sins. That will still continue. The Mashiach himself, the prince himself, will bring an offering. Davka, it says, you have to look it up, Ezekiel 45, verse 20. 21, well, 20 and 22. And it says there, for unintentional sins. This, of course, is a monumental issue for Christians. Today, it means it won't be then. When Mashiach comes, all the Christians will feel very, very sorry. I pray that they'll repent beforehand. But all the Christians will do tshuva. But now it's a shocker. Now this is a very big problem for Christians. Why is this a problem for Christians? Because in the Christian Bible, it says explicitly that the sacrificial system, animal sacrificial system, is coming to an end. And first of all, the book of Hebrews, which is a book that is an explicit assault on the Jewish faith. Thirteen chapters in the epistle to the Hebrews is dedicated to showing why Christianity is true and Judaism, although once was true, is no longer true. And the book of Hebrews argues that the entire, all the commandments of the Torah are only a shadow, foreshadowing the future, and the sacrificial system comes to an end. See Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18. The entire sacrificial system was only a foreshadowing of the sacrifice in the future. See Hebrews 10, verse 5, openly. And the book of Hebrews is able to maneuver this, this epistle. A few weeks ago, I called it the book of Hebrews, and one Christian said, it's the epistle to the Hebrews. It's correct. It's a letter. It doesn't really matter. 27 books to most of them are letters. But the key is that the book, the epistle to the Hebrews makes it clear the sacrifices are done. The same thing, Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 6. So in Christian theology, there's not going to be any animal sacrifices in the Messianic age. Some Christians don't know what to do with these passages and suggest that the sacrifices that come into view in Tanakh and the Hebrew Bible in the Messianic age are a retrojective memorial 
to the sacrificial system that once existed. This is completely incorrect because it says openly it's for unintentional sins, for sins that are committed mipesi bishaygeg, sins that are committed unintentionally because people are being careless. An unintentional sin is not a sin that's committed that you just don't even realize you're committing the sin. As an example, let's say, I don't know, let's say you're walking in your living room and by accident you touch something that turns the candles a light on and just because your elbow hit it, that's not an unintentional sin. You didn't even realize you were doing it. It means you knew you were doing it, you just didn't realize you're not allowed to do it, you didn't realize it was Shabbos and so on. So therefore, this is the most important feature of the Messianic age, that all the nations will know the Emmas, all the nations will know the truth. And what are we doing here? What am I doing here? The whole purpose of this broadcast is that people will repent now. People will do tshuva now. But all the nations in the Messianic age will go, whoa, I made a terrible mistake, and they'll come to the Jewish people, and they'll learn the truth, they'll learn the Emmas, and they'll want to know the truth. And we look forward to this day. May we see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bamheiro Biomenu, quickly in our time. Great question. All right. Give me one moment. I already got the phone lines filled up this morning, which is good. David, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question, sir. Hi, Rabbi. Um, how are you? I just wanted to, first of all, say thank you for everything that you've, like, you're a big inspiration to me, and I grew up as a Pentecostal Christian 24 years. Um, my great-grandparents were Jewish. My grandmother was adopted and not raised religious, but I chose to follow the ways of the Torah, and I became a Noahide after 24 years of being a Pentecostal. And I just want to thank you for like all your knowledge and everything you do. And so basically my question is, because it's been hard, you know, making that transition, and I try to talk to my, my Christian family and friends a lot about, you know, the, the Old Testament, and I'm trying to understand at what point, if Christianity was originally a Jewish sect, basically, um, the disciples, when did they accept Paul's authority today to decide it's okay, you don't have to be circumcised, it's okay, you don't have to go to church on Saturday, go on Sunday, who made the final decisions for the modern day church? I'm just mm. trying to understand because I know there's a lot of different sects. Great question. Go ahead and hang them down to your answer. Uh, one one thing that got brought up was who, who gave him the authority to claim to, he didn't say these words, but it's kind of what it painted. How did he appoint himself as the big dog of Christianity? <laughs> there you go. Right. Anyway. Really, really, really great question. So um, first to get a sense of what Christianity is to Judaism, um, it's very much like uh, you've been a Christian, were a Christian for many years. It's very much like the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, meaning the Mormons. How is the Mormon Church related to uh, Assemblies of God or the Roman Catholic Church? That's kind of the distance. So if you want to know Mormonism is to Orthodox Christianity what Christianity was to Judaism. It was a, it wasn't like it was a little different, you know. It was a massive, massive change. But it is Christianity is a heresy of Judaism. Now, just like there are many different heretical groups of Christianity, some closer, not so close. It it varied. The Pentecostal movement, as an example which you were a part of, like the Assemblies of God, which is the most well-known Pentecostal denomination, you know, is deemed, was certainly deemed, and continues to be deemed as heretical by many Southern Baptists, as an example. Uh, the notion of speaking in tongues today, most Christians believe that the, those things have ceased. Now, the question is, at what point, how, the, who appointed Paul? Well, the answer is Paul was a very big fan of Paul. He liked Paul a lot. And Paul was making claims. He was making claims that it is his authority that he has directly from Jesus Christ that overrides anything else. And in fact, if you look at his epistles, 
you'll notice that he is arguing against his chief interlocutors, our fellow Christians, who had a different Christology, who held to a different view. So Paul was very much fighting his entire career with not uh, religious Jews, Orthodox Jews, right? Uh, but rather fellow Christians. So there was a, a war going on. And we see this battle unfolding in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the last two-thirds of the book of Acts, is really devoted to Paul. The book of Acts is called, it's uh, really, should be called the book of the Acts. Oh, it should be called the book of Paul. It's really devoted to showing how Paul wins the day. But we see clearly in the book of Acts that there are other Christians who had a very different view than Paul, who held that if you're going to become a, I'm just going to use the word Christian. Um, Christians didn't use the term Christian at the time, or it appears they didn't, because although the word Christian appears in the Christian Bible three times, in none of those on none of those occasions is that word used by Christians. Could be there were some Christians who used it, but it, it seems that's not the case, but we'll just use it because it's conventional. Um, there were Christians who thought that if you're going to become a Christian, you still have to keep the Torah, you still have to keep the commandments. And we see that this was a very, uh, very persuasive group and gave Paul a lot of trouble and made Paul very, very angry. So we see that everywhere. Galatians 3, it begins earlier, but in Galatians 3, he excoriates um, churches in Asia Minor, churches that he had already set up years earlier, and he calls them, you idiots, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you with this idea that you that salvation comes through the law, it really comes through grace alone. So Paul is appointing himself. He's claiming, this is very important, he's not claiming that he understands Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9. He never, mentioned, he never mentions the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 that missionaries routinely use. Paul claims that he has special revelation directly from Jesus, not like the supposed pillars of the church, and he did not get his authority from them. So you see what he's battling. You see what he's up against. And when he keeps repeating, I'm no liar, the reason he's repeating he's not a liar is because people, that's exactly what people are accusing him of. So it really was a um, an open court of Paul against his enemies because the religion is just building. It's like the Church of the Latter-day Saints. In its early years, it's building, and there's an enormous amount of infighting in the Church of the Latter-day Saints, including to this day. It, all sorts of issues and polygamy, they're fighting with outside, inside, fighting away. The question is, how did Paul win and others lose? So the answer is that Paul offered something that was really quite, um, it was a really, it was a marketing tool that was very, very effective. And he solved a number of issues. Judaism during the first century was a fairly popular religion. It was the only Abrahamic monotheism at the time. There was no competition. There was no other Abrahamic monotheism. Didn't, that was it. That was, if you wanted an Abrahamic monotheism, Judaism was the only, the only opportunity. So if Jews and Judaism were fairly admired in the empire. Now, the Romans and the Jews battled it out a bit, but it was usually over paying taxes. It wasn't over the religion itself. People admired the Jews for their beliefs, except for the resurrection. They couldn't wrap their head around that, why we'd want to resurrect. But they certainly, uh, the idea of one God was very attractive. The in the Greco-Roman world, the they were very well aware that the Jews had a a good relationship with the most important person of the Western Western civilization. That's Alexander the Great, who was considered divine, a god born of a virgin, 
And that Alexander the Great had any relationship with the Jews that was positive. For many, many reasons, Jews and Judaism were held. But there were some issues that they had with us. And those issues entailed that to be a Jew, to convert to Judaism, is a lot of mitzvahs, a lot of commandments to keep. And people didn't want to keep all those mitzvot. It's not like today. Today it's very easy to be a religious Jew. Today, if you want kosher food, you can get anywhere, really. If I travel in Indonesia, you can go into a big supermarket and have all the foods you can imagine with kosher from all over the world, except meat had to be brought in from Singapore or, Malay or, or Manila. But basically, you can get anything you want to. But then it wasn't so simple. Right? It wasn't, And circumcision, of course. So Paul essentially does two massive things. Number one, he says, you don't have to keep the commandments anymore. And the commandments that existed were only a foreshadowing of Jesus, right? So uh, Colossians 2, uh, verse 16 to 17. So you don't have to keep the mitzvot. I'm talking about ritual commandments now. And circumcision, he would scream about this. So he eliminated the problem of becoming Jewish is in that number one. When I say becoming Jewish, that means his iteration of Christianity. He insisted was a fulfillment of Judaism. So he said, you don't have to keep ritual commandments anymore and it won't save you. And if you put your faith in circumcision, that Christ will avail you nothing. He argues that in Glee, you hear what he says? That if you circumcise, then Christ will not even help you. And the other issue he addresses is the Jewish people are an ethno-religious group, but the real thing, real ethno-religious group. There are other ethno-religious groups today, but they're not really ethno-religious groups, like the Druze, for example, or a breakaway group of the Shia Islam. So today they don't allow conversions in or out, or the can't control out, but they don't want them in. So people think they're ethno-religious. Well, we can call them that, but they don't really come from the same family. The Jews are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the question, how do you join the Jews in any way? And, now you could be a Noahide, but, but and be heir to the blessings given to the Jews. So Paul solves that issue, and he says, oh, in the body of Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. That's how Galatians chapter 3 ends. So Paul Essentially, everybody is competing in this market of ideas, in this man-made religion that's synchronizing Judaism and the pagan ideas in the Greco-Roman world. Now, Paul didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, but he certainly held that Jesus was a divine sort of being in the, in the Roman sense. He was higher than others. He was the son of God in some way. He was not equal with the Father. That was, Paul didn't know about, never heard of such an idea. So you can understand why in this, as the, um, the Christian religion is developing rapidly, you can see why Paul hit, knew exactly what the people wanted and did not want. He synchronized pagan ideas or Greek ideas uh, Gnostic ideas. He says openly, he says, look, I have a secret mystery that no one else has. He openly says it. If you go to the Jews of Jesus website, they won't tell you any of this. I'm telling it to you. If you look up Chosen People Ministries on their website, it'll tell you that the proof of Jesus, of Christianity, can be demonstrated through hundreds of prophecies in the Hebrew Bible. But in fact, Paul is saying, no, I have special revelation directly from Jesus Christ, a mystery known to no other person. This is a mind-blowing thing. Listen to my, listen to my um, theology, listen to what this mystery. And he says openly in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, that no one else knew it. And if the leaders of the generations that killed Jesus would have known this mystery, they would have never killed kill Jesus. See Ephesians chapter 3. All you have to do is open Ephesians 3. You could just look up the word mystery. It's always Paul. So Paul is saying that I have secret knowledge. This is 
Echtiger means this is real Gnosticism. The world around us is broken. The world around us is, is filled with sickness and disease. But if you have special knowledge, you can learn who you are and how to escape this world. That's what's critical. So therefore, Paul is able to synchronize um, the Greco-Roman ideas with Judaism in a way that was most successful. And therefore, his interlocutors, his enemies, who were groups, we might call them Ebionites, um, and they failed and were thrown out of court and were crushed. It, it worked perfectly. Now, not keeping the Shabbos is in Paul. That means Paul does say that you don't have to keep the Shabbos anymore. He says it openly in Colossians 2, 16, 17. He says, in fact, let no one urge you about the Shabbos, about high new moons, what you eat, what you drink. Let no one tell you about this. Now, you may think that the reason Paul says that you don't have to worry about Jewish holidays is because he's speaking to non-Jews, and therefore they're B'nai Noach, and they're not obligated to keep Shabbos. That would have made sense. That's not what he argues. Look at verse 17. He says, because the law is only a shadow. A shadow is nothing. You could see it, but it's nothing. It's the only thing that you can see that isn't anything. A shadow just is an absence of light. So he says the law is only a shadow. It means it has no substance. And the essence is Christ. It means the whole point, this is like the, the Epistle of Barnabas. The Epistle of Barnabas will tweak it up, but it's the same basic idea. That book doesn't make it in the canon. So Paul wins, and Paul is already saying that Shabbos, Shabbos is... Ah, it says in Exodus 31 that it's icy Leolim, it's an eternal covenant. Ah, it says in Ezekiel chapter 37, 24 and 25, that Jews will be keeping the Torah. Paul could care less about those things. Torah says openly that the Shabbos, the commandments will be forever and will be present in the Messianic age. But the, you know, even today people don't read Tanakh. Can you imagine the ancient world, in order to read Tanakh, you needed a handwritten manuscript written on not cheap paper, but written on parchment, very expensive, papyrus, a plant, still expensive. It was very hard. The Paul could say what he wants and get away with it. Now, in Acts, we find that there's a big fight going on, and it's resolved that essentially early Christians only had to keep the seven Noahide laws, which includes not eating the meat that was offered to idols, which is forbidden for a non-Jew. Someone offers a meat, kills an animal for avoid deserve idolatry. N neither a Jew nor a non-Jew is allowed to eat it. But if you see in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, this is a big issue, and Paul says you can eat it. It's unbelievable. He got it. Now, the person who openly is going to say that the Sabbath is no longer the Sabbath, but Sunday is the Sabbath of the church, is going to be a man who lived a little bit later than Paul, um, who was who the bishop of Sidney that Paul had, a binge had visited, and that's the bishop of Antioch, and his name was uh, Ignatius. Ignatius is the first person that we know of that says that the, sa the Sunday Sabbath should be established for Christians. So that Paul won because he tapped in and essentially his ideas won out and the other ideas were thoroughly crushed. And by the time we get to the Council of Nicaea being fourth century, when Christianity is established as a, in fourth century Christianity is established as the official religion of the Roman Empire, all of his enemies, Nazarenes, Ebionites, they were around. It's not like they just all died immediately. By the time we get to the fourth century, when Christianity comes of its own, all these other groups are basically thrown out of court. It doesn't mean there wasn't some group out in a hut somewhere that did, but basically they were gone. They were out of town. They were finished. Even today, there are these little groups in, in Israel that are Ebionites. They call themselves Ebionites, but so that's how Paul won. He hit exactly what the people wanted. They want equality with the Jew without the commandments, 
and bingo, I'll give you what you want. If you have found this channel helpful and this has blessed you or your family members in helping bring you out of idolatry, I would love to have your support. Please consider donating to this channel directly. That would be pretty awesome. Donations can be done through PayPal, Patreon, or through snail mail. The links to all are added in the video description below. You can also click this link and it will take you straight to my website with a donate button, which leads you right through PayPal. Thank you once again for your kindness and consideration for supporting this work. Blessings for you, your family, and your home. Shalom. Thank you for your thoughtful question. All right, all right. One second. <laughs> there we go. All right, moving on to our next caller. Robert, you are live on the air. Go right ahead with your question, sir. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Rabbi. I hope your father's doing better. Um, I have a question for you. I know, like, uh, groups like the Jews for Jesus says that you can still be a Jew and a Christian both, but wouldn't that be akin to uh, Christians for Muhammad or Catholics for Martin Luther? It's, <laughs> they're making a big jump from one to another, and uh, some people would say, well, you can be an ethnic Jew and still be a, a Christian. The first Christians were Jews, but first Protestants were Catholic. Enough said. <laughs> Right, right. Great question. Go ahead and hang so, down to if you answer. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. So as it turns out, the Jews for Jesus, Chosen People Ministries, Chosen People Ministries really is much older um, than Jews for Jesus. And they were originally the American, I think it was called the American Board of Missions of the Jews. It's an old group. They changed their name a few times. Uh, in fact, the founder of Jews for Jesus once belonged to that group. In any event, there was a an awareness during the hippie movement in the early 70s when every when the United States was going through a tremendous turmoil. And this is Vietnam, hippies, Watergate, massive assassinations, you know, of Dr. King, of blessed memory, RFK. I mean, this is, you know, imagine this time where I think from the time JFK was assassinated, it's like America never really recovered. Tremendous turmoil. So there was a counterculture movement at the time. And the brilliance of Christians who were committed to converting Jews was they recognized that Jewish people, while not necessarily religious, this was not a time. Today, there are Orthodox Jews everywhere. But at the time, the reform and conservative movement was on the ascendancy, and the orthodox was, it was holding on, but it wasn't like today, where it's in to be orthodox and so on, and you know, you had a, a treasury secretary and major. So what they realized, however, is that Jewish people are, while most not religious in the United States, are very proud of their Jewish identity. They're proud to be Jewish. I'm not a religious Jew, but in my heart, I'm a religious Jew. We used to call them cardiac Jews. In my heart, I'm very religious. So people are proud of their identity. Remember, this is after the 67 war. After the 67 war, there was an ascendancy of, of nationalism. Here, Israel was on the brink of destruction, attacked by multiple armies, but very prominently Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. And within, I mean, it was like six days of war and then rested on the seventh. I mean, the world, so this caused a surgency of, of Jews were very proud of their Jewish identity. It was very, very unusual time. So the idea was that you could still be Jewish, but believe in Jesus. Now, what Jews for Jesus did, it wasn't just Jews for Jesus, it was uh, Christian missions of the Jews who gathered in western Switzerland, in Luzon, in the early 70s. They wanted to understand why the church had failed in its effort to evangelize the Jews and what new techniques could be used to finally bring the Jews to Jesus. They anticipated at the time that Jesus was to make a second coming by the year 2000, it was the biggest thing in the world. And 
they also, the 67 war was only just happened a few years earlier. So what could we do to bring the stubborn Jews to Jesus? And really some big, big names were associated with it. Big names, the biggest names in the evangelical world were very, very connected to this, what could we do? And they recognized that Jewish people don't want to convert to Christianity because they don't want to stop being Jewish. They're proud of their Jewish identity, ethnicity, and culture. So what, what could they do? Very simple. Just say, become a, you could remain Jewish culturally, ethnically, but we're going to adopt all the Christian beliefs. So it was a very, Jews to Jesus is a Baptist mission to the Jews. You want to hear a crazy story? I don't think I ever said on air. Many years ago, I debated the head of Jews for Jesus. His name was Jan Moskowitz. I debated him. You can, the debate, you can listen to the debate on my YouTube channel. And it was quite a lively debate. Okay. And in the debate, I simply said that, that Jews for Jesus is a Baptist mission to the Jews, which it is. A, they, they're, Rosen, Martin Rosen, Moishe Rosen, as he called himself, was a ordained Baptist minister. He converted to Christianity in the late 1950s. It's Baptist. They're Baptist. But they were brilliant. Like Paul, you, to the Jew, you come as a Jew. So you want to talk Jewish things. You want to say words like chutzpah and eat falafel, matzo balls. Fine. We'll just call him Yeshua, and it's the most Jewish thing to do. Jesus made me kosher. They actually used an OU symbol, a kosher symbol, on their T-shirts. And they got sued by the OU. Don't ask. Don't ask. So the key was that they weren't compromising anything. They weren't compromising a thing. That means you are total Christian, Trinitarian, Baptist, the whole deal. At the time when Jews for Jesus was formed, I think it was formed in 1973, uh, they were not into the Pentecostal stuff, and they wouldn't allow people in the high leadership to be Pentecostals. Today, they they let them in. They they won't rise to the top. So what they simply did was they compromised on something that was not relevant. That's rabbinic traditions. And the strange thing is that Jews for Jesus and Chosen People Ministries, they accuse me of being a rabbinic Jew. This is mind blowing. They accuse me of being a rabbinic Jew, but the only thing they keep are rabbinic commandments. They don't keep anything scriptural. Isn't that amazing? They like Hanukkah menorahs. That's rabbinic. You know, all these things they do rabbinic. They wear a kippah. That's rabbinic. It's not in the Bible. And they accuse, they don't keep scriptural commandments. It's mind blowing. So all they did was they compromised on something that's meaningless. Now it used to be. In the old days, I'm talking about in the old, old days, the Catholic Church did not like the idea that Jews would do anything Jewish. In fact, they would check in on Jews who supposedly converted and got baptized to make sure that they were, you know, not keeping any Jewish traditions or anything. Justinian, the Justinian the Great, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire from came emperor in the 520s, I think 525, 526, and he was emperor for nearly 40 years. He made it forbidden for a Jew to even say the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, or even use Hebrew in our liturgy. So that's how the Catholic Church was. You have to eviscerate any Jewish tradition. So Jews for Jesus had the insight to say, no, keep your traditions, Hanukkah, all that stuff. He just says Jewish to believe in Jesus. So that's how they do it, by blurring the distinction between Judaism and Christianity in order to lure Jews who would otherwise resist. It used to be in the old days when a person became a Christian, when a Jew became a Christian, he would say, I converted to Christianity. It used to be in the old days, they used to say, you sh a Jew should convert to Christianity. Today, they will never say that. Never. They hate that. Oh, I was telling you about Jan Moskowitz. So I... I debated Jan Moskowitz, and at the debate, I said that Jews for Jesus is a Baptist mission to the Jews. They're Baptists who want to convert Jews. And he was very upset by that. And I didn't allow him to interrupt me. I said, these guys are all a bunch of Baptists who want to convert Jews to Christianity. 
You won't believe the story. I don't think I ever told it. What happened is, sometime after the debate, I think it was a few months later, Jen Moskowitz drops dead. He was on a subway platform in New York. And I think, I th- I'm not sure, I think he had a brain aneurysm. Whatever it was, he fell. He hit his head on the, the concrete pavement of the train platform, and he died. He died. And I, I won't say who ever, but I got a call from a Messianic leader who I'm good friends with. I'm friendly with some leaders in the Messianic movement. It's totally a personal friendship of really. And he said to me, Rabbi, I just want you to know that Jan just died and I'm going to the funeral. And do you remember the debate when you said that Jan Moskowitz represents a Baptist mission to the Jews? He said Jan Moskowitz's funeral is going to take place in Trinity Baptist Church. That's where the funeral is going to be. And that's where it was. His funeral was held in a Baptist church. It's unbelievable. I don't think I ever told that story. So they're all Jews for Jesus, just Baptists. Rosen, who was the head of Jews for Jesus, was really a very hardcore person, a very tough fellow, and not an easy person, not a nice guy. He was, In general, the heads of Jews for Jesus are they're a little tougher than other groups. There are some Messianic groups where the leadership is not, you know, Jews for Jesus is more hardcore because they're, the organization was built in the image of Rosen, and Rosen was a very tough guy. I met him one time. He did not like me. I mean, he. there are Messianic leaders who I know who are privately were friendly, you know, and are whatever, whatever it is. Rosen was not that way. He was a very hard person. He was hard on his own people. He was hard. He couldn't stand the Messianic woman. They hated the Messianic woman. They hated it. See, now Jews for Jesus will call self Messianics. If you see the guys who are heads of Jews for Jesus today, they all call themselves Messianic Jews. Rosen would never allow them or throw them out on the head for saying that. Rosen hated Messianic congregations. The old leadership, the old guard of the Messianic, of Jews for Jesus still do not call themselves Messianic Jews. There's a guy, I won't name him right now, although he's a very famous guy. He used to he'll be a leader in Jews for Jesus and one for Israel, who admitted that the whole Messianic movement, not long ago, he's not with them now, he admitted the whole Messianic movement is nothing but a cult. Nothing but a cult. Jews for Jesus, Rosen felt that Jews belong to churches, not in Messianic congregations, and the whole Messianic movement is just going to lead non-Jews to become Jews, and he was right about that. In fact, when Rosen died, so after he died, he had a letter that was not to be published until after he was dead. I'm pretty sure it's on the website still. It certainly was on Jews for Jesus' website. And he writes about his his antipathy, his his hatred for the Messianic movement, what an idiotic movement it is. He believed that Jews belong in churches. Jews belong. So that, now the, what happened was the Messianic movement caught on like wildfire and the term Messianic caught on. So today, every you could be the Pope, and but you're Messianic. Today, everybody likes the term. So Rosen didn't get his way completely. But he was a kind of Paul figure. So today, the whole Messianic movement the whole, all the Hebrew Christians call themselves Messianics. Jews for Jesus, of all of them, are the most antinomian, Pauline, Christy. Like, you'll hear leaders in Jews for Jesus say, you know, I'm a Hebrew, I'm Jewish and I'm a Christian, right? But many other Messianic groups will not use the word, I'm not a Christian, I'm Messianic. You got it? So, People understandably view the entire messianic movement as completely monolithic. It's they're not. They're just like the Protestant world. Some of them are are uh, charismatic, meaning some of the God type. Charismatic movement is not even. It's just it's a little more than a century old. Or they're fiercely anti-charismatic, like Southern Baptists. Southern Baptists and Jews for Jesus are very very close. Jews for Jesus is like the most hardcore anti-Torah, the, as hard getting at messianic group, meaning, uh, Jew, you know, converting Jews. But they're the they're the least 
friendly towards the idea. But the founder of Jews for Jesus never, 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 ever called himself Messianic, couldn't stand it. They also fought between each other. Even to this day, the Messianic groups fight with each other like crazy. And really, it does us a lot of good because they, they're battling each other over who gets to do where, who gets to do the Passover seders, the Messianic seders, and so on. They always fought within each other. So that's really how the movement grew. But they're only just using outer rabbinic traditions and customs in order to sell a thoroughly Christian movement. Anyways, thank you for your question. All right. I don't know if I told you this, but um, whenever I left the when I left the Messianic movement way back in gosh, it was well, it was over ten years ago, um, probably twelve twelve years ago when I was leaving. They had uh, some of the local congregations got with uh, with one Messianic leader guy and sent him out here to try to recruit me back to the Messianic movement. And uh, he got so frustrated with me, he threatened me, like, like, metaphorically threatened me, um, in the house, because I would, because I, w- he wasn't getting through to me. And as he was walking out the door, I said, "Man, I'm sorry, you just, you're gonna have to leave." I said, "You know, if we can't have a peaceful conversation, you know." And I was walking him to the door, and, and he didn't want to leave, and I kind of kept invading his personal space. And he finally made it to the front door, and he turned around. My wife and David. At the time, David, of course, was 10 years younger. He was like nine years old. Uh, my wife's in the kitchen, and the front door's right. There's a kitchen, and then the dining room, and the front door's all in line of sight from each other. And he literally said, he said, if this were in the days of Pentecost, I would drive a spear through both of you myself. Mm. I kid you not. The Messianic leader said yeah. this. I was like, wow. Good riddance. You know, I'll say something <laughs> else that will surprise the viewers. I don't even have a caller. The most anti-Jewish, or the, the the groups that are most responsible for anti-Semitism in the Protestant movement are Messianics, because they're the ones who go to churches, Gentile churches, of course, and they tell them how they're being persecuted for Christ. It's really crazy. Mm, right. But Jews for Jesus stirs that up. They go into these churches, and the church is filled with nice non-Jews who are otherwise have a favorable view towards the Jews, and they say, oh, we're being persecuted for Christ. Another topic, but that's what they do, and they can raise a lot of money that way. But unfortunately, they throw gasoline on a fire. Anyways, yeah, good yeah, point. Wow, crazy. Okay, moving on to the next color. Dale, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your question, sir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Doing well. Uh, <laughs> so, wow, I, I am still processing what Tovia just said with uh, Messianic Judaism and Baptist and you and uh, assaulted in your own place. I, um, as a former, I'm pushing 60, and I live, uh, I guess it would be the belly button of the Bible Belt of Kansas, and uh, I, I am a former Southern Baptist, and I, I know that spirit, and I know how <clears throat> that viewpoint of we're right and everybody's wrong, and it's 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 vicious at the the heart of it. And I was in it in a very long time and I knew high Kanakers in the leadership. And, uh, um, and I actually talked to a messianic, uh, rabbi, um, in this local area. And I asked him, where do you go to Yeshua? And, you know, what's his background? And he grew up in a secular Jewish family and, uh, uh, converted to Christianity um, in California, and and he says like no other. He's just no different than any other Christian. And I just, I, I just find it interesting. I'm sorry, just got off topic, but hmm. um, uh, yeah. Um, so my my question is, um, I'll be as succinct as possible. Um, when I talk to Christians and we have a discussion, I have basically three trinity if you will points with them is that the innocent do not pay the price for the wicked and um without blood there is no forgiveness and if you don't believe in the messiah you're condemned and and one of my points with the innocent do not pay the price for the wicked i've been getting some pushback and i had some interesting um points made and actually talking to william he he said something while i was on hold he, he, 
Thank you, William. You had that was actually brilliant what you said. Sure, and you I, just just go ahead and present your question to Rabbi if you don't mind. That'll okay, be good. And, and let All him right. tackle it for um, you. Okay. Deal. Um, okay, so the concept of the innocent do not pay the price for the wicked that's stated in Ezekiel eighteen twenty, Jeremiah thirty one twenty nine, and uh, um, Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen. And it's very clear in Tanakh that that is the case. And then in the second commandment in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, where someone that creates a graven image and that their children are cursed as well um, to whatever generation. But the, the nuance point in there is that, well, they also hate God. So they're, they're continuing in that sin. So it, that's something I can discuss. But in Yochoyuchin, when he is cursed for his sins and none of his um, children or descendants can um, sit on the throne, um, even though one gets a signet ring at the end, it's still the point of, well, God does curse those who sin and it's passed along to their children. And I guess one point where I try to talk to them, and that's one thing I'm talking to you, Tovia, for some nuanced insight on this, is my my perspective is like, well, in Matthew, I think it's 27, where, it's, where the Jews say that the blood is on us and on our children, it's like, that's their declaration? That's not God's declaration. And it's I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how do you differentiate between the Second Commandment and Jaconia, and then the whole concept of the innocent do not pay the price um, for the wicked as far as, uh, you know, spiritual death and, and from there. So that, that was my question. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead and hang up and tune in for your answer. Thank you so much right, for deal. clarifying All that. All right. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank Bye. you, Dale. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right, go ahead. You know, I'm sure that some of the people watching me right now um, almost a month ago, voted for Kamala Harris, and many of the viewers voted for Donald J. Trump. And I'm sure you view each other very differently and view the world differently because those two candidates had very different views and issues and, and policy and so on. But regardless of who you voted for, regardless of whether you voted, you're in a red state or blue state, I'm sure it would break your heart to think that there was an innocent person in an American jail languishing while the criminal is free. We all want that the, the people who perpetrated crimes are punished and the people who are innocent are vindicated. It doesn't mean you believe in capital punishment, don't believe in capital punishment, but no one would ever in their right mind want an innocent person to die for the sins of the wicked. And if, if in fact, the United States would adopt such a idea, you would rebel. You would say, you're crazy. That's the... So how could, if you have that sense of moral justice, how could you imagine for a moment that you have more justice than God? And as it turns out, in the in Christianity, God really, although he's called loving and merciful, he's not loving and merciful at all. At all. I know it sounds good, but it means Jesus loves you and oh God loves you and love you, love, love, love. They really talk it. But in Christian theology, God cannot forgive someone for their sins if the person confesses their sin renounces the sin, repents of the sin, and turns away from the sin. As we see in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 through 50. Cannot. Someone's got to pay the price. Galatians chapter 3. Why does someone have to pay the price? See, this is the price you pay, pun intended, for worshiping idolatry, for venerating Jesus as a deity. So... What do you mean someone has to pay the price? Why can't God forgive? God in Christian theology cannot forgive sin. If someone, you know, Christians are so apt to use, couldn't God, if he wanted to, come in the form of a man? I was at the Western Wall this Friday night. A Christian came over to me and said, couldn't God want to come in the form of a man? 
So they don't mind using that could and God. The point is they're saying that God is um, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can do anything. So why, if he could do anything, why don't you apply that same algorithm, that same standard, that rigorous method, and say, if God wanted to, couldn't he forgive people who repented. Moreover, we see in Tanakh, many people repent and God forgave them without any sacrifice. Menashe, the people of Nineveh, Vechula, Vechula, and so on and so forth. So the idea of Akeres Atonement was very well known to the Aztecs and the Mayans who engaged in human sacrifice, but it's forbidden to the Jews. And you pointed out the salient passages in Jeremiah, in Deuteronomy, in Ezekiel, where the prophet opposed strenuously opposed this idea. But then you brought up the question of Yehoyachin, Jeconia. So Jeconia was among the most wicked kings of Klal Yisrael. He's one of the latter, one of the last of the Davidic kings, and he was he did horrible, horrible things. And Jeremiah, in fact, cursed him in Jeremiah 22, verse 30. And he's, God said that and Hashem said, essentially, that none of his children can ever sit on the throne of David. So, just so you know, it, it doesn't say that any of his children will be punished. It's just none of his sit children will ever be qualified to sit on the Davidic throne. And in fact, Yahyach in Jeconia served as king for only a few months, a few months, and his the person who followed him was not his child, but rather his uncle, his father's brother. Now, it's not a punishment if you can't sit on the throne of David. That's not a punishment. I have news for you. I can't sit on the throne of David either. It's forbidden for me. If I would proclaim myself a king and sit on the throne, I would. it would be a grave sin for me. And in fact, that's why the Maccabees were ultimately wiped out because they took upon themselves a role that's forbidden to them. So Yehoiachin, Jeconium, had children and grandchildren, and they're just not eligible to sit on the throne of David. That's not a punishment. The only people who are eligible to sit on the throne of David are descendants of David and Solomon. No one else can sit on the throne of David. They're not punished. You're just not eligible to be to do that's all. I don't know, in the United States, if you were not a natural-born citizen, let's say you were born somewhere else, right? So you can't be president of the United States. There are some rules in the Constitution about who's eligible to be president. You have to be 35 years old. You have to be born in the United States. Let's say you were born somewhere else, and your parents, as a child, came to the United States and became citizens. You're a citizen. You're a perfectly fine person. Would you say that person is punished? Because that person cannot be president or vice president, it's not a punishment, it's just you're not eligible to be. So you can't, the word punish is not appropriate there. It's the exact same way. Let's say a fellow was born in, I don't know, Mexico, born in Cuba, children came over when we were young. You know, very fine person. You could be you could be a congressman, you could be a lot of you cannot be president of the United States. No one in, no one would ever say that this is a punishment. No one's punishing anybody. The only people, however, that are eligible to be president are people who were born in the United States. Okay? That's all. So, Jaconia's children uh, weren't punished. They just, his line is banished. There is a tradition that Jaconia repented in Babylon, which creates a big problem for Christianity. It, this is so crazy. Do you know that Jeconia's his name is Yehoiachin. His father was Yehoiachim, almost the exact same name. And when Matthew removes, he removes quite a few names from the genealogy found in Matthew chapter 1. He wanted to remove Jeconia, but whoever edited it, we don't know who did it, but he actually removed the father, Yehoiachim, is deleted. It's one of the deleted names. Because the names sound almost identical, that's how it got it got removed. So therefore, you can't you can't have. And, and you pointed out brilliantly, brilliant. You're so smart. 
most people have trouble with the Torah says those who sin, you know. So, the, the, so up to the third and fourth ge- and fourth generation, I'll punish those who hate me. That means they continue to hate me. So you had a grandfather who was a Nazi, and you're still an anti-Semite. I'm going to punish you more. You know, I've had it's happened to me over the years, where the grandchildren of Nazis, some of them very well known came over to me here in Israel. And they were happy to meet me. And they apologized to me for what their grandparents did. And I didn't know what to say. Very sweet people. Very, their grandparents were not just Nazis, but very famous Nazis. And they apologized to me. So what, I, I didn't know what to really say. I really didn't know what to say. Because... I, I said, you know, Thanko is very, very thoughtful. So what I really wanted to say was, you didn't do anything wrong. Your grandfather did something. Hard. Your grandfather was a monster. I didn't say that. And he would have to apologize to the Jews who he harmed. Not you. You didn't do anything. I didn't, I, this happens many, many times. I had one fellow I interviewed years ago who was a member of the Nazi youth, Hitler youth. And I think he was 15 or 16 at the time when he was a member of the Hitler youth. And he also apologized to me. I said, why are you apologizing? I don't know what to say. Because really, go, you should be apologizing to Holocaust survivors. You know, he didn't he personally did not take part in any murders. He And I just asked him to explain to me the best he could what what were you thinking at the time? Like, wh- wh- so he explained he explained to me as best as he can. So I don't think I ever told the story. So many times I have met the grandchildren of Nazis who have asked me for forgiveness as though I could forgive them as though they did something wrong and Although my great grandfather was murdered by the Nazis in '44, I can't forgive them on his behalf. And the Nazis had to apologize to him before they murdered him and the family in the spring of '44 in Hungary. So, in any event, so that's what I really wanted. I don't remember how, because I've dealt with this a number of times where I've met Nazis in Israel who, I mean, the grandchildren of Nazis in Israel who have asked me for forgiveness. You don't want to say you, you know, they're they're being very sweet and they're filled with guilt. I I don't want to tell them. I had to find some nice way. I just, you know, let them know that they were being very thoughtful. I wanted to tell them you can't. I don't remember what I said. I just said it in a nice way because I thought it was a very nice gesture, but it doesn't really make sense. Grandchild is not a perpetrator, and you're not speaking to a victim. So, in any case, so there's, it's not a punishment that one cannot be a that one cannot be a king. That's not a punishment. Ninety-five percent of the Jews are not eligible to be Mashiach. It's not we're not punished for it. It's just a certain family. There is a tradition, I think, alluded to, that in fact Chaconia repented in Babylon, Babylon, and in fact the curse was reversed and removed. We don't see that in Tanakh. I mean, in Tanakh we see that his great grandson, who was Zerubbabel. How, how did the game say it? Um, however, it's called Zerubbabel. So we see that he was made governor, but he was never called king. But there's a tradition that he was in Babylon, he repented, and as a result, God forgave him and withdrew the curse. And therefore, Meshach does come from him. So you really have done, you could have handled the whole thing yourself because, in fact, you're giving me examples in Tanakh where um, the innocent cannot die or suffer for the sins of the wicked. One other catch, I get this question 5,000 times, and that is in Tanakh or in rabbinic literature more, you have in Tanakh as well, but explicitly, that when a tzaddik suffers and dies and we weep over the suffering or death of a tzaddik, so God forgives our sins. So, But that person did not die for our sins, 
It's not vicarious atonement. It means in Christianity, Jesus was a ransom for our sins. Mark 10, 45, Matthew 20, 28. That's sick in the head. But, but, however, if a person here sees that a righteous person is killed and or dies and you begin to cry over the death of a tzaddik, of a righteous person, so that will trigger a complete repentance and God will forgive you. That person didn't die for your sins. That person died because he died or she died. But when you weep, when we think about the Asari Harugia Malchus, the ten martyrs, you think about Miriam, you think about all these people, it could bring an atonement if their death co- co- triggers within you a weeping. And that's why it says in Isaiah 57 verse 1, God is very, it's a excoriating chapter, and Hashem says that I took away the righteous from your generation, no one gave it to heart. So that you can have, but that's not vicarious. Person could see the terror attack of October 7th, see what happened, person starts crying. So Hashem will forgive you all your sins over that. That does not vicarious atonement. That's very, very important. Vicarious atonement is totally pagan. It's an abomination. Anyways, thank you so much for your thoughtful question. Let's get the next color queued up here. Okay, Miss Elena, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question for Rabbi. Oh, okay, excellent. Boker Tov, uh, it's excellent to be here with you, Rob Singer. And um, I just had a question. Um, I've heard you say before that belief in Yeshua is idolatry. Um, and I wanted to know if you feel the same about people who venerate and um, uh, listen to and follow the Talmud and certain uh, sages. What? I, I, I didn't understand... Christian, there's a very big difference in worshiping. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, Appreciate I think you it. got it. That's that's actually good. A lot of thank you. Now hang up your hang up and tune in for your answer. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Rabbi. Well, you're first with that question. Interesting. So, Christians, ninety-eight percent of them worship Jesus as God, as the second person of the triune Godhead. They worship him as God, co-creator, co-eternal. Um, eternal God, very light of very light. They worship him as God, as creator, as the word who became flesh, John 1, 14. Now, what John has in mind, or the author of the prologue has in mind, is something different. But they worship Jesus as God. They pray to Jesus, through Jesus. They pray to him as God. It's not a veneration. It's not like Christians look at... um, Aquinas, you know, and may consider him to be a brilliant genius, you know, or, or uh, Augustine, probably the most highly regarded of the church fathers, the Bishop of Hippo, and they think, Havdel, they think he was a great man. They, the, the Catholics and Orthodox hold him to be a saint. But they don't worship him as God created the universe. The Christians worship Jesus as God, with the exception, notable exception of some groups like Unitarians, Christadelphians, the J Witnesses. There are groups that don't, and they're considered heretical. So, yes, yeah, so n- no one worships the sages. I mean, that would be complete idolatry if I were to, chas worship any great rabbi as divine that never occurs. They're considered people who are just very great. Certainly the authors of the, you know, the people who were the heirs to the prophets. So these are very, very great people. But no one would even worship a, a, a prophet as God ever, ever, never. <laughs> that would never, never happen. Look, please God, we will soon see the resurrection of the dead. Probably not very far away now. Yeah, very soon. Mashiach is right now ready. And it'll be followed by the resurrection. So certainly when I imagine meeting Samuel the prophet, it'll be amazing. But no one would worship him ever. If I, when I meet Daniel, when I see Daniel, I'll be 
very excited. Very excited. No one would worship him. Oivad Yahu, who was a prophet, when he saw Elisha, he did bow down before him, but bowing down is not a form of worship. It's just like Joseph's brothers bowed down to Joseph. They weren't worshiping me as God. It was just, we don't, Westerners don't pra, don't do that. You know, Japanese, they bow to each other. The sushi was terrific, the bowing, but we don't do, that's not our practice. But in the ancient world, people bowed out of a, a great sense of enormous respect. So, uh, so Christians, Trinitarians, worship Jesus as God. It's complete idolatry. So it's not only idolatry, it's the worst version of idolatry because Christians all believe in the Father. To be that they believe that the true God is God. All Christians do. But they believe that there's another member of the Godhead who, while the same as the Father in many features, meaning omniscient and omnipotent and immutable and so on, they believe that he has a distinct person, which they worship as well. This is the worst form of avoid the Zorah. In fact, the Ten Commandments begins, I'm Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods upon my face. Why is it upon my face? It means this kind of iteration of idolatry. That's even worse than bowing down to a statue. Worse. If you have a choice, worship is bow down to a statue or, or worship Jesus, it's better to, the both. It's, it's really like asking the question what's worse, crack or heroin? But whatever it is, this version of idolatry where you believe in the true God and he has an association, a partnership, but any, that's the most grotesque. Because it's you're married to God and then you've got someone on the side. It's horrible. So no re religious Jew will ever worship sages or the writers of the Talmud or anything. Now, do we have crazy people? Do the Jews have any crazy people at all? No. We never had a crazy Jew in history. <laughs> I'm not saying there are no nut jobs or people who have just lost their minds. I'm sure there are. But those are not, you know, normative. The people who maybe worship their sister-in-law, I have no clue. But nobody worships these people. We admire them. We look up to them. There's certainly people who were part of the Messorah who carried over the teachings of previous generations for sure, but not worthy. It's not only not worthy of worship, it's forbidden to... It's one of the 13 core principles of our faith that it's forbidden to pray to anything to, but, but God. Absolutely forbidden. Anyways, thank you for your question. All right, let's get into our next caller. One second. Okay, Joseph, you are live on the air. Please go ahead with your question. Hey, Rabbi. Hello, William. Um, so my question is, um, we were mentioning earlier about in Ezekiel 45, I believe, that Mashiach will bring a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the nation. How is he able to do that if he's not a Kohen? Like, how can... He's a king, but he's not a Kohen, so he can't... It's my understanding he can't bring an offering like uh, Cohen would, so how is that possible? It's like Jesus wasn't either. <laughs> Interesting. Good question. So I just say, keep you on the phone for a second. Sure, I'm go ahead. Gone already. Yeah. No, I mean, you, are you, th I know, I know, I'm just, it's really, really simple. I mean, are you saying that only, the only people who are eligible to bring, to have a sin offering brought on behalf of themselves are Greece? Of course not. You know that. So anyways, thank you for your question. The answer is that um, that anybody, even non-Jews, could have sacrifices brought on their behalf. The actual person who who actually performs the shechita and the collecting of the blood and the carrying of the blood and the sprinkle of the blood, so that's done by a kain for sure. But sacrifices are brought for everybody, including non-Jews. Including non-Jews, so, and it says there also Hanosi beYaimahu baAdoyu vad Kol Am Parchatos that the Nosi, which is the prince, has uh, brought on his behalf a, um, a a sin offering. In fact, if you go to the parsha, 
to the portion of the Torah that addresses the sin sacrifice, which is Leviticus chapter 4, there is an assignment for different people, including, you know, what happens if a priest sins, a person who is a... Many people sin at the same time, whatever. Offering, in fact, in the book of Malachi, Hashem is angry at the Jews, as usually is the case in the prophets, and he says that the Goyim, the non-Jews, bring animals that are much healthier and nicer than the ones you're bringing. So sacrifices could be brought for everyone. It's not a question of who actually does the, it's called the avoidus adam, which means the the ceremonial features of actually doing it, but it's, you're bringing it. In fact, what the person who brings an offering had to do was to put his hands on the animal before it was offered, and he had to, you know, put his hands on it and saying, you know, I'm designating this animal. But the person who actually facilitated, that means the four parts of what's called the avodis adam, which means the ritual associated with the blood is the one who slaughtered the animal, collected the blood, carried the blood to the altar, and sprinkled the blood. That had to be done by a Kohen, no one else. But he did it on behalf of anybody. Okay? All right, great question. Thank you. Sorry, Robert, did you finish up? <laughs> I've been on the phone. I did. I caught you by surprise. <laughs> you Sorry. Yeah. That happens a lot later. I know you're talking to your sister-in-law <laughs> right now, and you're on the phone with your bookie, and you're on the phone with your stockbroker, but no, we, we did it. You, ca- it. you caught me red-handed. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, give me one second to find the right color here. Hang on. The Jets are going to win the World Series. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you now. Uh, here's, okay, here's an interesting uh, color with an interesting question. Okay, uh, it's me from Philadelphia. Go right ahead, my friend. You are live on the air. Greetings, Rebbe. Um, the question is, very quickly, that if someone, let's say a serious Nazi, who actually committed acts of murder, undergoes a serious and sincere conversion to Judaism, does that person actually get a full atonement? And by the way, I'm still diving for your father, Rabbeinu, Shlomo Zalman, Hakohen Ben Lea. Ask you please also David for my father, David Moshe Ben Chayahoda, who also is still recovering from his issues. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I'll hang up and wait for your answer. Okay, thank you. And Rabbi, just uh, um, on the spin, I've heard so many times uh, the Christians believe that, like Jeffrey Dahmer, as long as he bowed his knee to Jesus in his mind and heart before he died, you know, he's a cannibal, you know, the murderer, uh, that he saved. That's To me, that sounds like nonsense. All right, so it's, I'll point, I, I must point this out to you that, um, that Tanakh goes out of its way to point out the worst people in the world who repented, who committed murder, who sacrificed their own children to Molech, and God forgave them. Now, God knows the heart. You were right don't know a person's thought of the heart, but Kosh Baruch Hu knows the heart, knows the thought of every man. Now, why does the Tanakh, for instance, you have in the end, of, right at the end of Second Chronicles, that Menashe, who was the king of, of, the, of Judah, he was a Davidic king, he was the son of Hezekiah, and he was so wicked, wow, was he wicked, he actually murdered his own grandfather. He murdered his mother's father, Isaiah the prophet, killed him. So, then why does Tanakh point out that he was carried away captive by the Assyrian Empire and he was brought to Bavel, to Babylon, and there he was chained and fettered and when he had nowhere to go, he turned to God and repented and God forgave him. Why him? Like, why does the Bible look at Menashe, who was one of the worst Davidic kings, one of the worst people in all of Tanakh? Why him? I'm sure there will be nicer people who did less things that are not as bad. So there's a very simple thing here. Listen to me, sweetheart. And that is that what it, it really, Tanakh wants to address the reason why people 
do not repent or reluctant to repent with a full heart. Why? If atonement is really as accessible as the Tanakh says it is, then why don't people really do tshuva? You see that people, friends who smoke cigarettes, quit smoking, and when they quit smoking, you have a 30-year-old fellow quit smoking, in five years, by the time he's 35, his body has rebuilt itself completely and his life expectancy is the same as though he never smoked. And people quit all the time and live long lives. I had an uncle like that. I had an uncle who was, as a young boy, I remember he smoked and he was very overweight. And what did he do? He repented. He, what did he do? He quit smoking. He lost a lot of weight. And what was the result of that? He lived very old. He lived to his 90s. He would never live that long. Now, people know that because doctors tell them, but people really feel that God will never forgive me. God will never forgive me. So this is a very big issue. And that's why what Almighty, blessed be his holy name is, he actually gives us examples in Tanakh of the worst people in the world who did stuff that you never imagined doing, Imagine bringing your own child to Molech, right? To, it means killing your own child. And yet God forgave him and restored him. What's the message? Well, if God could forgive him, he could certainly forgive me. That's the key. That's the key of why the worst people are given as an example. Because the reason why, from the viewpoint of Tanakh, People don't do tshuva because they think that God will never forgive me. God is so angry at me. He hates me so much. I'm such an ugly, dirty, filthy person that he's done with me. You don't even know how bad I am. You don't know what a horrible person. You don't know what disgusting things I've done. And people really feel that, like, when they die, like, you know, there'll be just ovens waiting for them to burn in hell forever. Because they can't imagine that God would ever forgive them. So Hashem says, no, I could forgive you more than you will ever forgive yourself. And if you want to know the one who doesn't forgive you, go look in the mirror. You have trouble forgiving yourself. So therefore, in Tanakh, we are given examples, the people of Nineveh. What was Nineveh? Nineveh was in Akron, Ohio. What was Nineveh? Nineveh was in Trenton, New Jersey, another exemplar city. No, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Who could be worse? They repented after they were told that the city would be overturned. And it was overturned, but it was overturned spiritually, and God forgave them. And if God could forgive the people of Nineveh, he could surely forgive you. And I say this to you. I know that when you look in the mirror... You don't see someone who's beautiful, but you see someone who's ugly. You don't see someone who's holy, but you see someone who's contaminated and irredeemable. And it is on this feeling that Christianity could thrive, because it, in fact, that coexists quite well with Paul's message, that you are a sinner, you're lost, there's nothing you do to save yourself. But Paul's teachings were incompatible with Tanakh. Hashem loves you more than you know. He created you exactly the way you are. He gave you a, you were born with a good inclination because you created in the image of God, and Hashem put uh, evil in the world so you should have free will, so virtue should be possible. He adores you. He just wants to be close to you. Would you be consider? Would you consider having Devekas being close to Him? See Deuteronomy chapter ten, verse twenty. Shem wants to be close to you, turn to him, he'll return to you. See the book of Malachi. Forgive yourself. And remember, the worst people in Tanakh did tshuva, repented, and God forgave them. And if he could forgive them, he could surely forgive you. Remember that. And we thank you so much for joining me here today. And thank you so much, William. Very Shalom. good. Thank you. It's been fun. A lot of great callers. Um, some of you have not gotten through. Uh, be sure to tune in next week. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Turn on the all notifications bell so you don't miss. Shows are not always at the same time. So if you wanted to get those notifications, be sure to click that notification bell. Turn all notifi notifications on.
and you shouldn't miss anything. If you're on Facebook, just follow me there as well. Go to out, uh, outreachjudaism.org for Rabbi Singer's two-volume book set. CDs are no longer available, but the audio files certainly are. You just click the free audio tab at the top of his website, and they have the correlating title chapters. Different information. This is not an audio book. This is extra information. If you've been reading the books without the audio, as Rabbi would say, you're like kissing God through a towel. You want to get both. So, uh, Rabbi, once again, thank you for your time, and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you same time, same place. Well, maybe not same time, but it's definitely the same place next week. Hashem willing. Peace, everybody. Shalom. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shafa. <laughs>